All praise and thanks belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May the peace and blessing of Allah be upon his servant and final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As to what follows my dear respected brothers and sisters in Islam. In a few minutes I have, I wanted to share with you a few reflections from the opening passage of Surah Al-Mu'minun. Now I have a monumental task ahead of me and that is to explain to you how to acquire success through Salat. And I believe that the best way to do this is through the opening passage of Surah Al-Mu'minun. In this passage, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He speaks to us about the qualities and the characteristics of true, upright, committed believers. And He says at the beginning, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ But just before I begin with this, I wanted to explain to you, I wanted to explain to you my choice, why I chose these ayat. You see, what I believe is that for the average Muslim, he sits to himself and he's sort of convinced that he's doing all right, he's doing fine in terms of his relationship and worship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you sit to yourself and you say, Alhamdulillah, last week I attended a fundraiser and I gave $100 fee sabirillah. I pray and I'm regular with my, with my prayers. Sometimes I miss one or two, but it's not like I neglect the salat all together. You know, I, I fast Ramadan, I give zakat, I've done hajj, I intend to do hajj. And you sort of, you begin to be convinced and feel that Alhamdulillah, I'm doing fine. Then you add to this list the things that you're staying away from. I've never committed zina in my life. I've never murdered or killed anyone. I haven't associated or worshipped other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't consume alcohol or I don't consume interest at riba. And so you begin to develop this attitude and you think you're doing fine. And with this, another much worse attitude settles and develops. And that's known as a lackadaisical attitude. And basically what that means is that you become not interested, you become unconcerned, and there is no more enthusiasm inside of you when you read ayat in where Allah Azza wa Jal has set a high standard for the believer. So you read, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ You say to yourself, what's khushu'? That's not me. At least I'm الَّذِينَ هُمْ عَلَى صَلَاتِهِمْ دَائِمُونَ At least I'm those who are regular in their prayers. Khushu' is not for me. That's something else. And this is what happens. You read this ayah and you're uninterested. What does khushu' mean? What is it? How to attain it? That's not me. At least I'm from Surah Al-Ma'arij over there. I got something. And this becomes a problem. Every time you read ayat where Allah has set a high standard for the believer, you just run straight past it and run straight through it. And this is why I believe that for us to reach that high standard Allah wants for us and wants from us, no better place in the Quran than the first and the beginning passage of Surah Al-Mu'minun. And I tell you something, I say it is a high standard because at the end of that passage, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises a high reward. He says at the end of the passage, أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْوَارِثُونَ الَّذِينَ يَرِثُونَ الْفِرْدَوْسَ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ You know what al-firdaus is. That is the highest level in the paradise. And he says, whoever commits to these ten qualities, for them is nothing except for al-firdaus. This is the highest. So a high standard would equal to a high reward. And this is in the hadith or in the author of Yazid ibn Babanus, just to show you how high of a standard it is. Yazid ibn Babanus, radiallahu anhu, a companion, sorry, a tabi'i. That means he came after the companions. He didn't get to see the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He leads a group of people one time to the house of Aisha, radiallahu anha, the wife of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he, and he asks her, Ya Aisha, كَيْفَ كَانَ خُلُقُ النَّبِيِّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ Aisha, could you describe to us the character of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم? And who better than Aisha will give an answer describing the character of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم? So she said to them in general words, كَانَ خُلُقُهُ الْقُرْآنِ That's very general. She said that his character was the Qur'an. In other narrations, كَانَ قُرْآنًا يَمْشِي he was a Qur'an that would walk. 
So he didn't only take the information of the Quran and memorize it, it actually he applied it in his life and it changed him. That's what he was. So as they're walking away, she calls them back and she says, come over here, come back. And she says to them, Ataqra'una surat al-mu'minun. Do you people know surat al-mu'minun? Does anyone among you know it? Has anyone recited it? Has anyone memorized it? So one of them said, I know it. So she said to him, recite. And he began, Qad aflaha al-mu'minun, alladheena hum fi salatihim khashi'oon, until he reached the 10th ayah. And then she said to them, more specifically, she said, Hakadha kana khuluqun nabiyyi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Those first 10 ayat are specifically the character of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So I tell you, my brothers and sisters, this is a high standard. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us all. And in saying that, you might think, okay, that was the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why are you telling us about it? He's someone else and we're so different, we can never reach his level. But that's wrong. Because Allah azza wa jal began the passage by saying, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ And al-mu'minun, for those who know Arabic, that is a plural. And the singular is al-mu'min. So Allah Azza wa Jal says, the believers have succeeded. In other words, he made you and I, he gave us a chance to be part of this group. He did not say, qad aflaha al-mu'min, that the believer has succeeded. If it was in the singular tense, then the mind would have only thought of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, no one else. So the opportunity is open. You can be one of them. Al-mu'minun, a plural. Then Allah Azza wa Jal begins this surah. And I want to begin with the first ayah, and I'm not going to have time to share the ten qualities. I'm only going to have time to share one of them. الَّذِينَ هُمْ عَلَى صَلَاتِهِمْ يُحَافِظُونَ أو فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ And I'll tell you why this is the most important out of all. Let me begin this surah. Allah says, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ The believers have already attained success. They're already living in success. So what we learn from the first ayah is that the believer doesn't wait until the day of judgment to meet his success. He's actually successful from today. Because aflaha is a past tense. In other words, that's already the case of the believer. He begins, he says, aflah al-mu'minun. Now, for most of us, you probably know that the word aflah, if you don't know, I tell you, it means success. That's the, the sort of, that's the rough translation. It'll yield success. But you know, in the Arabic language, there is more than this word that also means success. There is the word faza, dhafara, najaha, tawaffaqa. All these words could have been used. Allah could have said, qad faza al-mu'minun. He says that about ashab al-jannah, wa ashab al-jannati hum al-fa'izun. But in this place, he said, qad aflaha. Not qad faza, qad dhafara, qad najaha, qad aflaha. And you know why? You need to look at this word and ask yourself, what is, what is meant by this word that is different to all the other words that mean success? What kind of success is aflah? And let me share this with you. Imam al-Sha'rawi rahimahullah, he has a beautiful insight into this word aflaha. He says that the word aflaha, it comes from the word fallah. And a fallah is a farmer. And you know, if you are to study the life of a farmer, you find it's a really difficult life. It's not easy. The farmer has to wake up early every single day. He has to make sure that the seed quality is right, that the soil is right, the quality of it is right. He needs to plant each and every single seed into the earth, under the heat or whatever it is. Then he needs to ensure that every single seed gets its enough water, it gets water. And then he needs to ensure that it gets enough sunlight for it to grow. And then when it grows, he needs to make sure it gets enough support so it doesn't lean left or right and break. A really tough life. And then as far as infestation and pests and so on, he needs to make sure that's all away from his heart, from his, from his farm. And add to that, every single day he works, he gets no money at the end. He doesn't get paid at the end of his day. Months would go, go by, so much time, so much effort in the farm, he doesn't get paid for it. But you know when he gets paid? He gets paid right towards the end of the season. When he harvests the fruit, and then he goes and he sells it, then he, that's when he makes money. But then he makes real big money. Huge check comes towards him. And you know, Sha'rawi rahimahullah, he says, this is the success of a believer, like the farmer. The farmer put so much time and effort in his farm, and he expected his reward at the end, and it was huge. 
And the believer lives like that. He puts a lot of time and effort in his worship, and he gets paid nothing now. He only gets paid in the hereafter, and that is al-firdawsahum fiha khalidun. So this is the effort, and this is the time you need to place in your worship. Now, because the time is short, I'll begin with the first quality. And please listen to this very carefully. Allah Azza wa Jal counts the first quality of the believers that have succeeded. How do you attain success? What is the first thing you need to do to attain success? He says, fi salatihim khashi'un. Those who, when it comes to their salat, they have khushu'ah. Let me tell you something, my dear brothers and sisters. We always speak about change, right? We need to change and we need to change what we do. And Allah Azza wa doesn't change the state of a people unless they change themselves and we hear that. But the first thing that needs to change is our prayer. You know why? Because that's the first thing you're asked about on the day of judgment. If that is good, if that comes complete on the day of judgment, then such a person, all his good deeds become accepted by Allah. And if your prayer comes on the day of judgment, and fasadat, the hadith says, fasadat, it's, it's corrupt, it's ruined, it's wasted, it was neglected, no care, no concern was put into it, then everything else good you did is gone to waste. Whatever Quran you did, whatever dhikr you engaged in, the goodness to your parents, which you felt will bring you closer to Allah, all that on the day of judgment holds back. If the prayer goes forward, then all this becomes accepted. If the prayer is gone to waste and on the side, everything else you've done good is gone. For this is a serious matter. That's the first thing that needs to change the way we pray. And what is, as the ulama call it, ruhu salat? What is the, what is the soul of the prayer? What is the core of the prayer? They say al khushu'ah, khushu'ah, that is the core of the prayer. A prayer without khushu'ah is like a body without a soul, it's dead. So I say the first thing that needs to change is khushu'ah. Once you develop khushu'ah in the salat, the salat becomes better. You become better, everything else becomes good, you're accepted with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let me share this ayah with you and tell you how to attain the khushu'ah in practical steps. That's my, that, that is basically the, the goal, that's my objective. To give you some practical steps in how to attain this khushu'ah. But before this Allah says, الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ He says, those, when who, those who when it comes to their prayer, they have khushu'ah. Now notice the language. He did not say, الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي الصَّلَاتِ he did not say, those who when it comes to the prayer, they have khushu'ah. He said, those who when it comes to their prayer, salatihim. In other words, he ascribed the prayer to yourself. The ulama, they say, asnad al-dhamira ila anfusihim li'annahum humul muntafi'una min as-salati wa laysa al-musalla lahu. You know why Allah did this? Why he said, those who when it comes to their prayer, ascribing it to them, because no one benefits from the salat except you. Allah doesn't benefit from your prayer. So he ascribed it to you. It belongs to you. That is the first step of attaining khushu'ah. You need to feel like you own this salat. You need, to, you need to treat this salat as though it's something in your pocket, you own it. You know when you own something, you have your car, you own your phone. How much care do you take about it? How much concern do you give it? You clean the car every week or every month or whatever it is. Your phone, you buy it new, you make sure it doesn't get scratched, no one touches it. Once you begin to develop this idea and attitude in your mind that the salat is something for me, I'm benefiting from it, that is the first step of khushu'ah. You own it. And every single benefit is in salat and it all goes back to you. What is, we're speaking about physical benefit, medical benefit, social benefit financial benefit, guidance, all of it is found in salat. You know, social benefits. How many times do we hear a brother or a sister, they say, yeah, wallah, I met this sister, I met this brother in the masjid the other day, and he offered me this crazy job, or he gave me this crazy ID. Where did he get that ID from? Wasn't it from the masjid? What got you to the masjid? Wasn't it the salat? That's a social benefit. You benefited from something, and the reason for it was the prayer. 
The prayer has all the, all the benefits you need. All go back to you. Now let me explain this to you. Khushu'a. What is khushu'a? I tell you this, I want to define khushu'a and then give you the practical steps. Khushu'a, my dear brothers and sisters, the ulama, they say it's khawfun fil qalbi yadharu ala al jawarih. It is fee that begins in the heart and it manifests on the limbs and on the body. So in other words, it's like a paralyzed effect. They say khushu'a is when the bones become weak and the numbs and the, and the muscles become numb. That is khushu'a, a paralyzed feeling. That is something you see day in, day out. I tell you where, with your children, for those who have children, right? And I have children of my own and I know this through a personal experience. When your children, their eye is glued to the iPad or when it's onto the TV screen, do they move? They don't move. They're like this. That is khushu'a. When you're paralyzed, you don't move. And I had an incident with my son. Really horrible experience. I was at home once, and I'm lying on the, on the couch. And he's sitting on top of me. He was still, you know, toilet training. And he's watching the TV, and he's so glued into it. Two, three minutes go by, and then I feel my short get, shirt getting really wet and really hot. Because of the khushu'a, I say to him, son, that khushu'a needs to be in salat, not in watching the movie. And this is also in grown-ups as well. You're glued into something, you don't move. That is what khushu'a is. Paralyzed effect, you don't move. But how do you bring this to your salat? How does this come and how does it put in your salat? Let me share these th points with you. My dear brothers and sisters, you are wrong if you think that khushu'a begins to develop from the moment you say Allahu Akbar. That's wrong. Khushu'a, as a matter of fact, begins to develop way before the salah. It develops before the salah. And it develops in two things. And I want you to practically implement this from now on. Wallahi, it'll change your salat. I've tried it, others have tried it, and it has brought such a change to their prayer they just speak about it with whoever they see. And there are three things I want to share with you. Two before the salah, one during the salah. So bear with me, these are three and I'll be done. Number one, my dear brothers and sisters, khushu'a is attained the way or through al-wudu that you make before the salah. Through the wudu. When you make the wudu, most of us have no idea what the purpose, what is the wisdom behind wudu? Why do we make wudu? Right? Some of us, you know, you have a bit of paint on your hand, you've changed the oil of the car, the sister has a bit of flour on her hand, she's done some cooking, and then it's time for salah. I'll wash my hand, might as well just make wudu out there, and then I'll just go and pray. And you begin to think that the only reason for wudu is that it physically cleanses my body. And that's true, you physically clean your body when you make wudu, but there's a greater purpose. There is a purpose that Allah spoke of in the Quran and the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam again says in the hadith. And my dear brothers and sisters, listen, the purpose of wudu is to cleanse you spiritually. It cleanses your sayyat. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says to Amr ibn Abbas in the hadith, he says, when you make wudu, when you wash your face, the sins of the face drop with every last drop of water. The words that you spoke that are haram. What you saw that is haram. What you heard that is haram. When you wash your face, the sins of the eyes are dropping as well with every drop of water. He said to him, when you wash your hands, the sins of the hands are dropping with every drop of water. And when you wash your feet as well, the sins of the feet, where your feet took you to the haram, you wash them for wudu they get rid of the sins of the feet. And so Allah Azza wa Jal wants to clean us spiritually before we stand His hand, before we stand in front of Him. He wants you to be clean. And I told you this passage is about, is about a high standard. And the high standard, a believer, when it comes to prayer, he doesn't sit down and think, did I eat a camel burger so that my wudu was nullified? Or did I go to the bathroom? 
All right, last smile will do. A believer doesn't think like this. A believer says to himself, did I sin from one wudu to another? Did I sin? Did I commit a sin? Did I speak something haram? Did I look at something haram? Most definitely you would have done something haram. He gets up and he makes wudu for every salat. Because he knows the wudu adds. It adds to his khushu' in salat. When he makes wudu, when you and I make wudu, it wipes away the sayyat you committed from one prayer to another. Now you're ready to stand before Allah. Allah puts you in that state, in a cleansed state before Him, so that you may see this khushu' and it comes to life. That's the first thing. The other thing you should be conscious of when making wudu is that wudu is the thing that would identify, that the Prophet ﷺ would identify you through. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says in the authentic hadith, إِنَّ أُمَّتِي يُدْعَوْنَ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ غُرًّا مُحَجَّلِينَ مِنْ أَثَرِ الْوُضُوء He says, my nation will be called out on the day of judgment from the marks and traces and effects of wudu. In other words, how does the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recognize you on the day of judgment? He doesn't know you. He's never seen you. How would he know you? He knows you through the marks of wudu. He said, غُرًّا muhajjaleen," And غُرًّا muhajjaleen is the whiteness on the forehead of a black horse. When you look at the whiteness on the forehead of a black horse, it's easily recognized. The people of wudu, that's how they are recognized with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the day of judgment. What an incredible worship Allah has given us. What an incredible preparation Allah has given us. We haven't even started the salah yet, and we're already ready to attain this khushu' in salah. These are two, two points that you need to be conscious of every time making wudu. It's wiping your sayyat, and that's how Nevisinja sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would know you on the day of judgment. That's one thing. The second thing and the second way in how to attain the khushu' before the salat is what you dress and wear to salat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-A'raf, Ya Bani Adam, khudhu zinatakum inda kulli masjid. Children of Adam, wear the best of clothing at every single time and every single place of prayer. You know what's ironic and what's really funny? But not only that, it's really disappointing and really saddening that we, the, we wear the best of clothing to every single function and event. Whether it's a wedding, whether it's an engagement, whether it's going to be a formal dinner you're invited to, whatever it is. And the place Allah told you, wear the best of clothing, that's the place you don't wear the best of clothing. Where's Khushu'a going to come? And as a result, where is success going to come? You need to wear the best of clothing at every single masjid and every single time and place of prayer. One of the Salaf, rahimahumullah, he used to have special clothing hung up on the wall of his masjid that he only used to wear when it was time for salat. And they used to say to him, Ya Imam, why do you have this special clothing? He says, that is clothing I never sinned when wearing. And when I wear it, I feel really clean and close to Allah. I have cleaned myself or cleansed myself spiritually through wudu and physically on the outside I'm clean. I'm wearing clothing that I've never sinned against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with. Before he started Allahu Akbar, he's already attained 80% khushu'ah. Subhanallah. This is something you need to look into and be really careful about your wudu and your clothing before you start. Now there's one more thing I want to share. And please listen to this carefully. This is... I'm going to call the secret of attaining khushu' during the salat. From when you've said Allahu Akbar, how do you get that khushu' What is the secret of that khushu' Before I share it with you, I have three questions. And I want you to answer them as loud as you can so I make sure you're with me on the same page. My first question is this. Out of the 12 months of the year, which is the month in where people have the most khushu'ah? Ramadan. That's right. During Ramadan, the 30 days of Ramadan, 
Which prayer is it that the people have the most for sure? Taraweeh, Qiyam, the night prayers. During the Qiyam and the Taraweeh, which is the time that people have the most khushu'ah, so much so that they actually begin to cry? The witr, the dua. You know why? Why do people cry when they're making dua? When the Imam begins and says, Allahumma najjina min al-nar, Allahumma rzuqna al-firdaws al-a'la, Allahumma atiq riqabana min al-nar. When the Imam begins to ask Allah, give us the paradise, save us from the fire, free our necks from the fire, people begin to cry because they actually know that they are in conversation with someone. They're talking to someone and they expect a response from someone and it moves them so much so that they begin to cry. They have the secret of khushu' and they don't even know about it. Let me tell you what that secret is. That when you stand before Allah and pray, you need to know that you are talking to Allah. Speak to Him, address Him, talk to Him. This is a two-way conversation, not a one-way conversation. That's why our heart is dead and there's no khushu'ah. Because we feel like when we talk in prayer, we're only talking to ourselves. I like giving the example of a phone. You call your friend now. If he picks up the line and he answers your call, you begin to engage in conversation because you're talking to someone on the other line. But let's say you call your friend and he doesn't answer and you're diverted to voicemail. The way you leave him a message isn't the way when you speak to him live. For most of us, our prayers like that. It's like we're gone to a voicemail and we got no idea what we're doing. And therefore we rush through our salah, we run through it because there's no taste. We're not talking, we're just wasting time. But the believer, those who have khushu' in their salat recognize that they're, in con they're conversing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the secret. And one of the salaf rahimahumullah who was praying once and he began, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. And there's a really, he had a long pause. Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. Another long pause. And a long pause. He finished the salat. Those who prayed behind him came to him and said, Why did you have these long pause between every ayah in Surah Al Fatiha? He said, Because after every ayah, I'm feeling Allah's response. When Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in the hadith, that when the servant says, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds and says, Hamidani Abdi, my servant has praised me. And I, I want to feel that Allah is telling me that I have praised him. Ar Rahman Ar Rahim, Qala Allahu, Athna Alayya Abdi. Allah Azza wa Jal would say, My servant has overpraised me. And I pause to feel Allah's response. Malik Yawmiddin. And Allah says, Majjadani Abdi. My servant has honored me, he's glorified me. And I pause to feel Allah's response. And I don't care who's behind and who's in front because I'm in conversation with the King of Kings, with the Master of creation. When you have that attitude in your salat, Wallahi, you will not dare to move. You will not dare to scratch your hair even if you need to scratch it. You won't dare to do anything. But the unfortunate case, you look at our salat, how horrible is this state? You pray, when really this is ironic. The people pray, he's rushing. He's got an appointment, he's late. He's woken up for Fajr already late. He gets up, Allahu Akbar, Alhamdulillah, You know the, the, what the irony in this is? He's reading it because he's running out of time. And Surah Al-Asr, its message from Allah is telling you, you're running out of time. And he's reading it because he's running out of time. How hopeless is that? What did we read and what did we understand? My dear brothers and sisters, my time is up. The brother's pointing to me that the time is up. So I need to conclude this. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us people of khushur, people, serious people of commitment, people of the Quran, 
people who seek and attain the guidance from the Quran. إنه ولي ذلك والقادر عليه وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وجزاكم الله خير. Da 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 da.